if you were here the first week, you, you saw me grab a stone out of the baptismal water. And you were encouraged to grab your own stone. In fact, if you don't have one, you're welcome to come up and, and take a stone with you today. The stone we've talked about is, is a representation even of our lives. And we've talked about the, the effect that, it, that a stone has when you skip it across the water, how there's, it hits and it, there's a ripple. And it hits and there's another ripple. It hits again and there's another ripple. And you can just sit and watch. Even after the stone is gone, you can watch the effect, the story of the stone. We talked the first week about how it doesn't really matter which stone you pick up. What matters is what you do with the stone, whether you choose to hold on to it or whether you actually cast it on the waters. We talked about how each stone, how each of us have a purpose for God's glory. We also talked about how sometimes, sometimes hitting the water can hurt. Sometimes that water is not as soft as we might think it is. Sometimes when we encounter life itself and some of the challenges of life, it can it can be painful. Last week we talked about Lydia and we talked about how some, some ripples start really small and, and can become a tidal wave. Today my question is, what happens if you cast a bunch of stones all at once? What happens if we grab everybody in church and we go out to the water and we all take stones and start throwing them all at once and, and there's not just a simple story of single ripples, but it's more like, if you've ever seen the kids grab a whole handful of sand and they run out there and they, they throw it and it just splatter effect, shotgun effect, and there's ripples everywhere. It's kind of mass chaos, right? It doesn't tell a story as much as it looks like chaos. Or anybody gone to Sky Zone with the kids? Love the going to Sky Zone. You love jumping on the trampolines, right? I do too. Um, but there's something that can happen that, that, that we used to call like this double bounce effect. Where, you know, when you're bouncing in tandem, you're jumping at the same time with somebody, everything's nice and smooth, and it's up and down, up and down, right? But then all of a sudden, somebody gets off beat, and, and what happens? You guys know what I'm talking about, because you've been there. And you can get this double bounce effect, where either you hit it when a person's coming up, and, and you, you hit it, either you get this real high bounce, and you come down crashing, usually like in the springs of the trampoline, or way off the edge, right? Break something. Or when you hit the ground, you're not ready for it, and, and instead of going really high, your knees buckle and you end up crashing down right there on the trampoline anyway. You see, sometimes ripples don't play nice. Sometimes ripples collide. And sometimes when there's a bunch of, of stones in the water at the same time, those ripples, they don't tell a story as much as they seem like chaos. When we look at Apollos, Apollos might not be somebody you know very well. I'm going to give you a, a brief little introduction here. Apollos was, was a well-known evangelist. In fact, probably right on par with Paul, although we didn't, he didn't write as much as Paul did because uh, we don't have those. But we do have a lot of information about Apollos. Apollos was from Alexandria, and I'm, I'm going to pull that up, actually. Um, hopefully I've got a light. Yeah, Alexandria, clear down here in Egypt. And actually, Alexandria was well-known community. They, you know, they had the great library. They had a couple of things like the lighthouse and the uh, necropolis that were known as wonders of the world in those days. He was from a, a big city with a lot of power and authority, he was, and he was well-known. He was a leader in the Jewish synagogue. And so then he decides that he is going to go up. He's going to go up to Ephesus, which is clear up here in Asia. So he sails across and eventually goes later to Corinth. He spends his time, this is Achaia over here, he spends his time up in there. Why? Why? Because he has something to share. In fact, um, Apollos was known so well that he's actually venerated. He's actually in the, the Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox, the Coptic, the Oriental Churches. He's seen as a saint. He has a special day where they actually honor Apollos. He's that well-known. People understood him to be one of the great evangelists of the early church. Think about it. He was, he was an elite in the rabbinic community. He probably had the same possibilities like Paul of actually ascending to be high priest at some point. He was respected, but he 
left his community, gave it up, because he heard something that was so valuable he had, he had to travel and tell others. You know what's something, something that I caught for the first time in this passage? Or maybe it just really caught my attention this time. He didn't really know Jesus. It says the only thing that he knew was about the baptism of Jesus. He didn't know of the miracles of, of turning water to wine or, or feeding of the 5,000. It, it doesn't say that he knew about the death and resurrection of Jesus. He knew about only the baptism of John. That struck me in a new way this week, and I, re I realized, you know, we often need so much proof, don't we? We need so much evidence to, you know, convince me, help me, make me believe that Jesus really is the Messiah, the Son of God. Make me believe it. But, but this guy, Apollos, only had knowledge of Jesus' baptism. And of course, the baptism where... John sees him coming and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He, he, he knew of that. And he knew of the baptism and, and rising when all of a sudden there's God's voice from heaven and the dove sets upon his shoulder. He knew that much and that was enough to convince him. That's exciting to me. In fact, it calls my own faith to question, why, why does it take so much? Why, why do I need any more than that, to believe. He was enthusiastic, he was fervent, even though he was limited in his knowledge. He didn't have to have all the answers. How many times do you think you have to have all the answers before you actually say, well, now I can talk to somebody about my faith? <laughs> I've heard this from a lot of people saying, well, you know, I don't really know enough yet, so I can't really share, I can't really talk to somebody about my faith. Well, you don't have to have all the answers. You just have to believe. So here he is. Now he runs off and he's, he heads up to Ephesus and, and he begins teaching and preaching. But then we find out that Priscilla and Aquila pull him aside. Priscilla and Aquila, another one of those great set of characters in the Bible that they're great mentors. They were good at pulling people aside and, and teaching them and saying, no, this is accurate understanding. And they, so they, they mentored him as well, and, and they got him educated more fully on the identity, the fullness of Christ's life and death and resurrection. And then he, he moves on and receives a letter of recommendation, and he goes on with their recommendation. So, so we've been talking now through the book of Acts, and we've encountered all kinds of people who've had different roles and different uh, impacts we talked about Lydia last week who started really small around a kitchen table and, and the ministry grew. The church of Philippi became something powerful. We talked about Peter. We've talked about Paul. We've talked about all of these different voices going on at once. And Now here's news if you didn't know it. The early church, they weren't perfect. The early church, you know, we like to think, oh, they had it easy. It was smooth sailing. There wasn't any problems. Okay, well, we're not even going to touch on the fact that there was persecution and death and killing and all that stuff. But they didn't even get along with each other. Did you realize this? They argued over silly things like the color of the carpet. They argued over who they would follow. In fact, later we find out Paul writes this letter to the first Corinthians, well, to Cor Corinth. We call it first Corinthians. He writes this letter because... There's arguing, there's dissension, there's disagreement, they're not liking each other. Why? You know why? Because one says they follow Paul, another says they follow Apollos, another one says they follow Peter, and another one yet says that they follow Jesus. Well, weren't they all following Jesus anyway? Now, here's, here's what I want to talk about a little bit today. That chaos of throwing a bunch of stones on the water all at the same time. When people are trying to watch the ripples, but the ripples don't even become ripples. Instead, they're, they're this mass chaos of jumble that we can't fully understand, and it's confusing and frustrating, and instead, we can't follow anything. Maybe, maybe it makes more sense if I just relate it to your personal life. Think about it for a moment. Have you ever had one of those days or weeks or months, years, when it just seems like there's so much going on when it seems like somebody's 
throwing something at you, and everybody's throwing something at you, and work is insane, and you're just really frazzled, right? Does that relate more? I think that's kind of what maybe is even happening in the church. And sometimes that happens in our modern churches. Sometimes that happens in our personal life when it just seems like things are chaos. I think Apollos has some wisdom for us here. Even though Paul encourages him and says, go back to Corinth and and get this settled. Actually, you know what? what we hear even from the historian Jerome, the Roman historian, not even, this is not even biblical. The Roman historian says that Apollos withdrew. He went with Zenus, who was a lawyer, went and retired to the island of Crete for a period of time. He said, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go get myself back in the mix of that. I'm not gonna, not gonna get in the confusion. I'm not gonna make it any worse. Let me put this in a different perspective. Men, at least, and this relates to me, I'm sure some women are the same way, do you ever just find yourself in one of, the, one of those circumstances or situations just really everything is going wrong and frustrating and you're not quite sure what to do with it and you just want to like get right in the mix and, and fix it? Does that sound like something you, you understand? Let's just fix it. Well, I thought about this image today. I thought, you know, when water is really doing this and it's kind of tumultuous and, and going all over the place, have you ever tried to like, like calm that water down by putting your hand on it and pressing down on it and say, calm down, calm down, chill? You think that works? I don't think it would work. In fact, I know it doesn't because you you push on it and and what? The water just overwhelms you also. And it continues to do this chaos. Apollos was wise enough. Apollos knew to withdraw, withdraw himself. Paul writes a letter. They begin to calm down and, and they begin to come back to a space of peace and understanding. And you know what then? Apollos returns to Corinth, becomes one of the elders of the church. I think sometimes we could learn from that. Sometimes we need to know when it's, when it's the right thing to allow someone like Priscilla and Aquila to, to mentor us. Or when it's the right time to um, actually withdraw ourselves from conflict. Why? Because Apollos knew that the focus needed to be on Christ. The focus had to get back on Jesus Christ. Not not to be on Apollos or not to be on Paul or Peter, but to be on Christ. And sometimes we ourselves have to become less that he might become more. I think we have to allow that to happen before we can even become the elder or the leader that God wants us to be. Whether in a church or whether in our own lives, we have to think about the ripple effect. Whether or not our stone is is adding clarity or whether it's creating chaos. We have to think about what we contribute in the process. And I think we need to understand maybe the best thing on occasion is to pull back and say, Lord, let the focus return to you. The question I want to send you out with today is is just this. Like I said last week, I, I want my stone to be, my stone to be like Lydia who's able to start things small and see things grow into a church that still affects us today. I want to be a stone like Apollos, who's who's wise enough to to take learning and, and still to know when to step back, even as a leader. I want to be a stone like Paul, who's able to to write letters of encouragement and support. I want to be a stone that leaves ripples that tells the story not of me but the story of Jesus Christ. What kind of ripples do you want your stone to leave? What kind of story will your ripples tell? And you know, when you really think about a stone cast on the water, every stone, whether we can see it or not, every stone 
those ripples that go out, and even when the stone settles to the ground, they've still left an impact and even raised the level of the water by whatever minute amount. You make a difference. You have a purpose. Your life tells a story. The question is, what story do you want it to tell? I pray that you will choose to be like some of these that we've talked about in the book of Acts. Let your ripple continue to be told for God's glory. Would you pray with me?